series right now called Messy. Messy, and we're in the Gospel of John, and so I hope you brought your Bibles or a device. Find the Gospel of John in your New Testament. Uh, We're going to be there as we have been several weeks. We're actually just over about the halfway point of our series for three months. We're going through the Gospel of John as a church. We're reading through every single verse of the Gospel of John uh, over the summer and going into the fall. Pretty good way to, to spend your summer and go into the fall. We've been doing that as a church family. And then we're looking at relationships that Jesus built with people so that, number one, hopefully we can identify with some of these people, these knuckleheads, these messy people that Jesus built relationships with and see, hey, God, just like them, wants a relationship with me. And then a step further, maybe to initiate some of the intentionality that Jesus demonstrates with all these different messy people, all these different relationships, because maybe you've got one too, a messy relationship or two. Uh, So hopefully we can initiate some intentionality in our own relationships that helps us grow and look a little more like Jesus. Not if you could use a little of that in your life today. I know I sure could. So I'm glad you are here. Today I want to talk to you about Jesus and accusers. Jesus and accusers. If you missed last week's message, I want to encourage you to go back to blackhawk.fyi. Check it out. We looked at the first four, uh, 44 verses rather of John chapter 11. We're going to pick up right where we left off today, John 11, 45, and we'll get into chapter 12 a little bit today as well as we look at Jesus and accusers. But this follows. Today's passage follows immediately after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. And so I had a great time. If you were here last week, I mean, we got through everything from the King James, he stinketh, uh, all the way to the great clothes at the end. We had a good time and we grew so much last week. But we're going to build on that now because really where we're at, just to zoom out for a moment, in the Gospel of John, John, first of all, is one of Jesus' very closest friends. And so he walked and talked with Jesus as much and as closely as anyone else during his life and ministry. And so John is the one giving us this trustworthy eyewitness account as he captured all that Jesus went through. And we're at about the halfway point or so in his Gospel. Right now, as we go into chapter 11, the end of chapter 11, into chapter 12. And it's interesting because the first half of John's gospel is really all about the first uh, three years. It's about the three years of Jesus' ministry. And so it's kind of a three year span, this first half. And then now at the end of his writing, the second half of his writing, it's like John says, okay, now we're going to slow down. Now we're going to zoom way in because whereas the first, three, the first half of the book was about three years of the ministry of Jesus, the second half of the book really zooms in on the last week or so of the life of Jesus. And so John slows us way down and we're at that point now where we're entering the end, towards the end of the ministry of Jesus and his life. And if we've learned anything about Jesus, I made a few lists of the ERS, the E-R-S, in Jesus' life. And maybe you could add to it and have some fun with that this week. But here's a few things that we've seen that Jesus has in his life when it comes to these relationships and people in his life. Jesus had haters, followers, lovers, users, abusers, posers, confusers, and even accusers. And that's what we're going to look at today. Lots of ERS. You name it, Jesus had those kind of people in his life. Today we're going to look at accusers. He had people that personally accused him. So we'll look at, number one, accusers of Jesus, and then we'll look at accusers of Jesus' loved ones. So let's start with number one. You ready for the word today? Accusers of Jesus. And this comes from right where we left off last week, John 11, starting in verse 45. We'll read through the end of the chapter, and we see accusers of Jesus himself. So the personal accusations that come about. John chapter 11, verse 45. I'll read from the English Standard Version today, and whatever version you've got, follow along with me, and let's read God's word. Now many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, remember this is right after he raised Lazarus, this is Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord. I love that. You should circle that. He did not say this of his own accord. But being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. 
Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Verse 55, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. And so we see these accusations of Jesus himself and all of these haters, these religious people, now they're trying to kill him. They're plotting and planning to kill him, to arrest him and to kill him. But it's right on the heels, though, of this story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And I always find verse 45 very interesting. So let's unpack that. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you could identify with Jesus where maybe people have said things because as we look today at accusers, I mean, this could mean any kind of persecution. And I must clarify, there's a difference in being a, a knucklehead and sinning and bringing problems on yourself and being persecuted. A lot of times we say it's one and the same sometimes, but here's the beauty. Our God meets us in both, doesn't he? Even when we bring problems on ourselves, God walks with us through that too, and his grace is sufficient for those times too. But today we're specifically looking at times where you're being persecuted, where you're being slandered, where mistruths, misinformations, where accusations are swirling, persecution and adversity and trials are happening because you're following what God has asked you to do. That's what's going on in Jesus' life. I don't know in what way you can identify with that, but I believe we can learn a lot from Jesus today. And right after he's raised Lazarus from the dead, verse 45 is so interesting to me. Notice what it says. It says that many of the Jews, many, many of the Jews who had come with Mary and seen what he did, he raised someone from the dead, believed in him. (laughs) I've always wondered if Jesus didn't say, Lazarus, come out, and he said, hey, all of y'all, come out. Uh, And and instead of raising one person from the dead, if he raised two or 10 or 20 from the dead, would the many have gone to all, (laughs) believe? But no, some didn't believe. Verse 46, instead some went and what did they do? They tattled to the Pharisees. Can you believe what Jesus did? Raised him from the dead. And that, by the way, if you're in any form of leadership and you think for a second you're gonna be able to please everyone, the son of God who takes away the sin of the world, who is fully perfect, who is fully God, who was there at the creation of the universe, has become, he's the word become flesh and dwelling among people and he just raised someone from death to life and he still couldn't please everybody. What makes you think you can? Side note, leadership 101 side note for you today. No extra charge for that one. But they went and they tell the Pharisees he's raising, and there's a reason. And what we see following in those verses is that they say, listen, if he keeps on this way, everybody's gonna believe in him. And what's gonna happen is the Romans are gonna step in. They're under the oppressive Roman government and they've been given this platform to be Jewish and to have their Jewish religious systems and temples and they wanna just kinda keep that in place. And they don't want the Romans to ruin that and this Jesus guy could ruin it all, but as I was thinking about that, before I share a few things about that, I was just trying to make that personal this week, thinking what I can learn from that, and here's what I came up with, and God really spoke to my heart about what the Pharisees were doing, because we're really hard on them sometimes, and Jesus was hard on them most of the time, so we should be, and we should learn the what not to do. Can I get an amen? Hopefully you've been learning that. We've been learning that in the series, but one of the things that has stood out is this question. I wonder how many times I miss the miracles of God because of my mindset. I wonder how many times I miss the moments of God's presence because my mindset is so consumed by earthly things rather than the eternal things. Like the Pharisees here, he's just raised someone from the dead. And I don't know about you, when that happens, I would think of like, let's get a cake or something, but they form a committee and get together as a council. That's what us church people do sometimes. And they say, well, what are we gonna do about this, Jesus? And they're, listen, they had the presence of Almighty God right in front of them. He's doing a miracle right in front of them, but because their mindset was so consumed elsewhere, they missed the moment, and they missed the miracles of God, the presence of God, because their mind was consumed in other places. And boy, I think that's so true of us sometimes. We have our minds so consumed by earthly things that we miss the eternal purposes that God is trying to bring about in our midst. We miss the miracles. We miss the moments. So don't miss, listen friends, don't miss the moments this week because your mindset is stuck somewhere it doesn't need to be. And that's what we see happening here in this passage. And they form this committee and it reminds you that I've heard it said many different ways in the past that some people do things And some people criticize people who do things. (laughs) 
And that's exactly what Jesus was running into. He was coming to establish the kingdom of God, and he was criticized, and he was accused. And verses 49 through 52, there's a lot of history and culture and context that we could go into there. I'll give you a few snippets. We don't have a lot of time today. But in those verses, so Caiaphas comes onto the scene. The essence here is that there was a concept that, and you might agree with it, and it's amazing that it's such a foreshadowing of the gospel and of what Jesus was here to do. But in this Jewish system and in this culture, it would be better if the whole nation was gonna suffer. It would be better if there's a scapegoat, if there's a a person, one person who could suffer on behalf of the whole nation so that the rest of the nation or a bigger group of people don't have to suffer. Let's just put it on that one person's back, let it be their problem, and then everybody else doesn't have to suffer. And that's kind of the general sense of where we're trying to go here with this council, with this committee, with this what do we do with Jesus. And it's interesting, Caiaphas comes on the scene and he says, you guys don't know what you're talking about because he had prophesied and John even has a few potentially even kind of little jabs in there because the Roman government actually was instilling high priests and that had not been the case uh, throughout history. And so it was a little bit of jab. because That year, Caiaphas was the high priest. He says it twice. So I don't think it's a coincidence. That's a whole other story. But as he's going through that, I love, I think it's verse 51. Look there with me again. Verse 51 as Caiaphas is saying all these things, hey, let Jesus suffer so that the nation doesn't have to. That's the bottom line. That's what's going on here. Verse 51, John notes, he did not say this of his own accord. And so here's what that means. That means God was using the evil, personal, selfish schemes and plans of human beings, even wrongfully motived motived human beings. Is that a word, motived? We're gonna call it that today. Human beings, human beings with wrong motives, human beings going about it the wrong way. God, listen, God was even taking their ploys and their plans and their schemes and working them together for his plan and his purposes and his glories. And listen, even though that was true then, it doesn't mean it ended today. It's still true for you today. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know who's plotting against you. I don't know what accusers you have in your life. I don't know what persecution's coming about. I don't know what depression you're facing. I don't know what trials are coming your way. I don't know what adversity you carry around, but my God is working it all together for his glory and his purposes and even for our good today, just like he was in this passage. God is not done with you yet. He reminds us of that in this passage. And then verses 53 and 54, they're plotting to kill Jesus. He can't walk openly among them. It's Passover time. And if you're unfamiliar with that, you know, it's interesting, John makes sure to make good note of Passover times. And this was a time where there would be a spotless lamb with no blemish that would take the place, that would be a substitutionary. It would, it would substitute in the place of sinners because sin requires a penalty of death. And so the lamb would be sacrificed. The spotless lamb would be sacrificed as a substitute for sinners. See some foreshadowing in that? And the ultimate lamb of God would become flesh and dwell among us. And he would be that ultimate sacrifice. But Passover was a time when that would happen. And maybe you wondered before, how do we know when we say that Jesus' ministry was three years? How do we know that? You ever wondered? One of the ways that we know that is John's gospel. When John's gospel, he gives us very clear note of three Passovers. So that's three years, a Passover each year. And this is the third one right before his death, before the death of Jesus would take place. And so John gives us a clear picture of that. But it's interesting, as we look at this, the moral, spiritual, and religious leaders, listen, they should be the people that know the presence of God the most, right? Not if you agree, it should be. They should be. They had the word made flesh dwelling among them. They had the presence of God, the son of the living God, standing in their midst. And what did they do? They hated him, and they wanted to kill him. And it just goes to show us that we can miss the miracles, the presence of God, because our mindset is so consumed somewhere else. May it never be so of us, Black Hawk. May we always see the moves of God. May we always see the miracles of God and not miss it because our mindset pulls us off. May we live in the moments where God is teaching us and not miss those moments because we get so distracted. And then they, at the end of this chapter here, they say, is Jesus even gonna show up to the Passover? They're constantly looking to catch him. You see kind of their heart, their motive, and, and they say, well, if he does show up, if anybody sees him, you let us know because we're gonna arrest him because we got business with him. And you know, I wondered, why, why is it that people hated Jesus so much? You ever wondered that? How could that have happened? These religious leaders, they should have known the presence of God the most, but they were so confused and they hated Jesus and they killed Jesus. Why? 
Why do they hate Jesus so much? I think it, there's so many answers to that question, but I think there's a root that is the same for us today as it was for them then. I think it has to do with authority. Jesus came with all authority. He didn't come to take it. That's what people thought he was gonna do. He thought he was gonna overthrow the Roman government and all these things. He, he wasn't there for that. He came for a bigger kingdom. He came with all authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It was his, but he came to establish that kingdom, to establish that rule, to establish that authority. And as he came, people like the Pharisees started to feel like, you know what, that messes with all the stuff I've ever known. We've never done it that way before. Famous last words of a church. And they, said, they started to see in their own hearts, and, and before you laugh at them, the same thing happens to us. When Jesus gets in your boat, he drives. And when that happens, all this junk that's in there that doesn't fit anymore, you're like, well, I gotta do something about that. I gotta change. And sometimes we don't wanna change. And the bottom line is we don't like to submit to someone else's authority, not if you agree. Those of you who didn't nod, you got some authority issues going on right now. We all, we all like control. How many control freaks are in the room? You're just, you know, I like to control it. All my way, right? We're all that way to a degree. And so I ask you, just like they had to wrestle with this question, listen, today, serious question for you. Who or what has highest authority in your life? It should be Jesus. And hopefully we're gonna say it's Jesus. And hopefully we're gonna really believe those things. But listen, so many times, so many times we'll say that but ultimately it's me, it's a sin, it's an addiction, it's my way, it's money, it's success. The list could go on and on and on. So who or what has highest authority in your life? Accusers of Jesus. Number two is accusers of Jesus' loved ones. It was personal for Jesus, then it shifted to his loved ones. Chapter number 12, verses one through eight, we see where Jesus' loved ones. This will be Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, and Lazarus that he had just raised from the dead. The first eight verses, they're getting together now after those accusations came towards Jesus. Now we're gonna see some kind of start coming towards the loved ones of Jesus. So he's getting it from every angle. Verse one, John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. With, with him at the table. Mary, verse three, therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, this reminds you, Judas didn't know all that when it was going down, but as he recounted all of these things and wrote them down, this trustworthy eyewitness account, he knew now and he looks at it through that lens. He said, verse five, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. There's a lot of money bags, you know, I wouldn't want to steal from, but the Jesus one, that, mm, don't want to do that one. Verse seven, now Jesus speaks. And here's where the rubber meets the road for us today, at application time. Verse seven, Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor... You always have with you, but you do not always have me. Let's go through this a verse at a time. Lazarus has had kind of a big day. It's been a big stretch for Lazarus. Verse one, so he's there. Uh, he's had a big week, wouldn't you say? You ever uh, defeated death before or come back from the dead before? Uh, that's a pretty big day. And what you'll find if we kept reading in verses nine through 11 of John chapter 12, the next several verses, is not only, listen, not only did they wanna kill Jesus, now they also wanna kill Lazarus. They were missing the moments. They were missing the miracles of God because of their mindset so much. Now they're looking to murder, not only Jesus, but also now he's even Lazarus because in Lazarus' name or in Lazarus' story, people are coming to him, hearing about Jesus and deciding to believe in Jesus. I kinda would think I might too, right? And because of that, they're like, we're, we're gonna kill Lazarus too. So like, he already died once, let's kill him again, right? And so that's where Lazarus is. He's had kind of a big week, this Lazarus. And, and verse two, they kind of throw a party. They're celebrating, they're having a dinner. Have you ever wondered like, what kind of party should we throw for a resurrection? I've done anniversary parties and retirement parties and birthday parties, but what do you do for a, 
a resurrection party. I don't know. I would like to have been there, though, and see the, the guy who was dead who is now sitting there reclining at the table eating. That's what they're doing there in verse 2. And it says that Lazarus, uh, and notice Martha served. Don't miss that. You notice how last week I told you how, how they all grieved differently? This week we're going to look at how they love differently and how they serve differently, just like we did last week. Martha served. She's the one that's the doer. Nothing gets done without the Marthas. How many of the Marthas? It's like, I just got to get it done. If it's not going to happen, i got to do it. Yeah, I'm thankful for you people. I'm telling you, nothing would happen in this world without the Marthas. And the same thing is true with Martha in this story. So she served, and Lazarus is the one reclining at the table. And i got to say, I would too if I had just died that week. It's like, I'm taking the day off. I'm reclining at the table. And then there's Mary, verse 3. She's anointing Jesus. She's at the feet of Jesus again. And it's interesting, Matthew Mark and John all give an account of this story. Did you know there's three times we meet Mary in the Gospels? In the Gospel accounts, three times we meet Mary. The first time, Jesus was breaking a mold, and Mary was breaking a mold because he was a rabbi, a teacher, and he was teaching. And she sat with the disciples. And women didn't do that then. But she sat, where? At the feet of Jesus, learning as Jesus was teaching. That's the first time. The second time was the story from last week. Uh, she's grieving. Her brother has died, and Mary, because, or Martha, rather, because she's the doer, she heard Jesus was coming, and she went straight to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dead, but Mary stayed back at the house. But Jesus called for Mary. He said, I want to talk to Mary. So Mary came to where Jesus was, and as she's grieving, where did she end up? If you remember from last week? At the feet of Jesus. She ended up at the feet of of Jesus. So the first time, she's learning at the feet of Jesus. The second time, last week, she's grieving at the feet of Jesus. And now, she's celebrating or worshiping. Where is she? At the feet of Jesus. Every time we meet Mary, she's worshiping. So Martha is our, our doer, our server. Lazarus, and by the way, did you notice, there's a whole chapter devoted to Lazarus. Did you know that we never have any record of Lazarus speaking? Now, we know he probably did because people asked him a lot of questions and people believed in Jesus because of him, but there's no record of him speaking. So I don't know, was he the quiet, strong type? I don't know. He's different, though, than, than Martha. He's reclining at the table. She's serving. And Mary, let's just call her, I don't know, there's so many words. I'll say passionate. Everything she did was passionate. Maybe the more emotionally wired person. I don't know. I'm not sure. But they loved Jesus differently. They served Jesus differently. And that's where Mary was. All three times she's at the feet of Jesus. She's passionate with her words. She's passionate with her work. She's passionate with her worship. She's also passionate with her wealth. Uh, this, this perfume, scholars agree, this would be upwards of like a year's salary. So she, first of all, had a little bit of wealth. If she had that to give, she must have had a little bit. Good for her. But she was generous and passionate with that wealth. What she had, she gave to Jesus. And, of course, that's where the accusations can continue. The betrayer of Jesus, the ultimate betrayer of Jesus, is now singling out the worshiper of Jesus. And we learn that he had been taking money all along, and he didn't do it with a right heart. He didn't really care about the poor. He cared about his pockets. And it's interesting, Judas, that this is the first time, maybe you've never noticed this, this is the first time in Scripture where we have Judas recorded as speaking. Did you know that? Is in this passage. And the first time Judas is recorded as Scripture as speaking is about money. It's a little foreshadowing, you know, Jesus would be betrayed by Judas, 30 pieces of silver. Maybe that's what had highest authority in his life during that time. But Judas speaks up and these accusations are now turned towards his friends and then Jesus responds to those accusations. He doesn't speak, notice, he doesn't speak until it's about the people that he loved. And he speaks up and he says, you leave her alone. You let her keep this, you let her do this. This is for my burial and I can't help, you know, this is the week and, and this kind of a fragrance, it didn't just fill the room, it probably stayed with Jesus a long time. And we don't know this, and this is speculation, but go with me for a minute. I've wondered, even in his last days, I've wondered as Jesus went to be beaten, and he took the lashes, as he began to carry his cross, I've wondered if there was still a fragrance, the same fragrance from the same week, where Mary had anointed him for what was coming. No. But I know Jesus loved them so much. And I know that Jesus prioritized people, even in the midst of accusations towards him and towards his loved ones. And he speaks up now that they come towards him. So I want to answer this question for the rest of our time together today. I want to give you six things today just that we can do to apply this. And there's way more than that. But here's the question. 
that I want us to answer. What can we learn from Jesus about dealing with accusers? And this is maybe it's opposition. What can we learn from Jesus about dealing with persecution, slander, misunderstanding, adversity, trials? What can we learn from Jesus, both in this passage and in the whole of Scripture? And before I give you the first of these things, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12 is from the greatest sermon ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus preached that sermon, and he gave us a very good insight that's going to serve as an umbrella for all of these things that I want to give you that I believe can become very personal for us today. And he said this, Matthew 5, 11 and 12, blessed are you and others revile you you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. What do you do with it? Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I do know this. Listen, look at me for a minute. If you try to follow Jesus, we live in a world that often says, hey, if you follow Jesus, uh, your bank account's gonna fill up and all your problems are gonna dissipate off into the horizon and it's just gonna go well. No, look what happened to the disciples. Look what happened to those who followed Jesus. They have problems. We're gonna look at that in just a few moments together. That's gonna be one of the things I'm gonna share with you. But Jesus said, hey, look at it from the other side. A lot of times we look at it from this side, the earth side. Jesus says, no, come to the eternal side. Go to the eternity side and look at it and see how blessed you are when people revile you and people persecute you and people slander you for my name. And you're going to see the reward is so much greater than the pain in this life. And some of you are like, that's nice, Pastor, but that doesn't help me in my problem right now. And I get you. I feel you. I do. It hurts. It hurts when you're trying to do what God has laid on your heart. You're trying to do what's right, and you feel like you run, after, run into wall after wall after wall, and maybe that connects with some of you. But what do we see that Jesus did? I'll give you six things. Number one, focus on ministry. That's what we see Jesus doing. Go back to our passage, John 12, when Jesus spoke up for Mary. Number one, focus on ministry. Jesus, what did he do when all this was happening? Accusations of Jesus, then accusations of his loved ones. So what did he do? He focused on people. He focused on the mission. He focused on ministry. He put other people first, verses seven and eight. He said, you leave her alone. Let her keep it to the day of my burial. He's saying, I've got a way bigger purpose going on here, and I'm gonna focus on ministry. How do I deal with opposition? How do I deal with persecution? What do I do about accusers? I stay focused on what I came here to do. That's what Jesus did. And we see that at the end of this passage. And as people were accusing Jesus and his friends, he just focused on the friends. He focused on the people. And as Je- listen, write this down. As people spoke out against Jesus, he spoke up for others. As people spoke out against Jesus, he spoke up. For others. I don't know about you, when people speak out against Kevin, I want to speak up for Kevin. Is that just me? I guess I'm a real ungodly dude. I'm here all by myself. I'll preach to me for just a minute. For those of you who might kind of sort of identify, I kind of want to speak for me when that happens. But Jesus says, no, I'm not worried about the me part. God's going to take care of that. Vengeance is mine. I know the end of the story. I'm not worried about people speaking up against me. I'm just going to do what God has called me to do, and that is speak up on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. I'm going to speak up for the lost. I'm going to make sure that the gospel moves forward. I'm going to make sure that I complete my purpose. I'm going to focus on God's plan, and I'm going to do the mission he has called me to do no matter the cost. That's what God wants of us, and Jesus has modeled that for us in our lives. And some of you are discouraged, some of you are depressed, some of you are disappointed today. Listen, I believe one of the greatest ways to remedy, to overcome discouragement, depression, disappointment in your life at any level is to focus on others. I know it seems counterintuitive, but just serve somebody. Do something for somebody else. And what you're gonna find is you get filled up so much more when you focus on ministry. You put others first. Jesus modeled that, so that's one of the things we can learn from him. Number two, write this down, but it's not what you expect. Expect it. It's not what you expect, because some of you are like, yep, I know, I expect it. I expect there to be problems. That's why I look at life through this negative, uh, and we'll say realistic, lens sometimes. No, 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 hold on a minute. Let's listen to the words of Jesus. There's two parts to this expectation. John 16, 33, same gospel of John. A few chapters later, Jesus said, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Expect it. It's going to come. I'm glad he didn't stop, though. He had another level, layer of expectation that followed. But take heart, I have overcome the world. 
Jesus is agreeing with what Peter said, 1 Peter 3, 16. He says, when you are slandered, be of good conscience. Just follow after Jesus. Focus on ministry. Expect that there will be opposition. Expect that there will be persecution. Expect that there will be problems. But he also says, but expect the end to come. But expect that I am coming back and I'm going to fix all of these problems. I've already overcome the world. All of it is solved. You live in the right now, but in all of eternity, it's going to be washed away. Every eye is going to be wiped dry. Every problem is going to be done away with. There will be no more sin. I have already overcome the world, and because of that, look at it from that perspective. Stop looking at it from over there and know that I've overcome the world, so now I can take heart. So I expect, yes, there will be problems, but equally and even more so, I expect that God has won that victory. And because he's won that victory, I can do number three. Number three is avoid victim mentality. Avoid, vi- that's pretty big these days. Wouldn't you agree in society, victim mentality? We just got a lot of people, just gotta preach for just a second. We just got a lot of people just looking to be a victim about everything. And I got two words for you. Stop it. But with all sensitivity, I do say to you, listen, if you're a child of God, you're not called to live with a victim mentality. You're called to live with a victor mentality. Romans chapter eight, let me prove it to you. Romans chapter eight, verse 37. No, in all these things, we are, read it with me, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. We're not called to walk around with a defeated mindset. We are to expect there's going to be problems, but even more, we know the end of the story. We know that Jesus has already won the victory. And I came to remind you today, we as believers are not here to fight for victory. We are here to fight from victory. That's why we don't have a victim mentality. We have a victor mentality because God has won the victory. He said on the cross, it is finished. He's won the victory. The victory belongs to God, and we get to take part in the victory as his kids today. Can I get an amen? God loves you, and he wants you to live with that kind of a mentality. And I think of Lazarus last week at the end of the story. He came out. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out, and he had grave clothes on. You remember that if you were here last week? I want to remind you of that again today. He came out, and Jesus said, hey, help him out. Take, help him out of those grave clothes. That's what we do. We walk around with a victim mentality, a death mentality. Lazarus was a new man. He was given new life, but he still had grave clothes on. Some of us do the same thing. We're new in Christ. We're new creations in Christ, but we walk around with the grave clothes of guilt, the grave clothes of condemnation, the grave clothes of fear, the grave clothes of you fill in the blank, and it is time in Jesus' name to drop all the victim mentality, to drop all of the grave clothes and live the new life as a new creation in Jesus Christ that he's called you to be as a part of his family. We fight from victory, not for victory, because the victory has been won. Number four, write this down, overcome fear with trust. This is a hard one. Overcome fear with trust. I'll give you a couple of verses for that. Psalm 118, verse six. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Jesus and accusers. Romans 8 again, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I was reading a devotion, and I think it was by Rick Warren recently, and he had a great statement that's just rung in my ears about fear and trust. Because I think really, here's what I think trust is. It's not relying on me, and it's relying on him. It's trusting him. I don't rely on me or anything else. I rely on God and God alone. And uh, Rick Warren said this about our fears. He said, your fears reveal where you do not trust God. That'll preach. It's been preaching to me all week. Your fears reveal where you do not trust God. Why? I think it's because fear and trust, they really can't coexist in the same place. It's got to be one or the other. And boy, it's easy to say, right, but hard to live. And so I don't know what has highest authority in your life in these specific areas, fear or trust, but I pray that today you can learn to rely on God and not you. And I wanna read from the New Living Translation some of the writing of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter one, verses eight and nine. I love what he says here about adversity and trials of the like that we're looking at. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure it, and we thought we would never live through it. Can you relate? He says, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, here's what I want you to catch. We stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. 
I love that clause at the end because it's like if you think, if you still think there's any comparison between relying on you or on God, remember who raises the dead. You done that lately? He raises the dead. I want to rely on him, and I know you do too. And the best way to overcome fear is to lean into trust, to rely on him and not ourselves. Because I think self-sufficiency is one of the greatest tools of the devil today. I need to say that out loud again. Self-sufficiency is one of the greatest tools of the devil today. If you think you got it, the devil has you right where he wants you. He's ready to pounce. You don't got it. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God sent forth his son. And it's a continual leaning and trusting in him. Last two I wanna give you today. Number five is to remember your, your example. Remember Jesus as your example. Second Peter, excuse me, First Peter chapter two, rather. First Peter two, I'm gonna give you a couple of things from this. The first part comes from verses 19 through 21 of Jesus as our example. Peter writes, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin, you're beaten for it and endure? This is the difference of like, I brought this stuff on myself versus I'm suffering for just causes. He says, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Here's the part I want you to catch. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We don't have a high priest who is not able to sympathize with us and our weaknesses, but he's walked where we've walked, yet he did it without sin. He is our example. So I asked you earlier, who's your highest authority? Maybe I should ask you as well, who's your highest example? Who are you looking to the most as a pattern to follow in your life, especially when adversity strikes, when opposition rises, persecution shows up? Who do you look to? And number six comes directly from those verses as well, and it's the last thing I wanna leave you with today, and it's to be obedient and trust God with outcomes. Be obedient and trust God with outcomes. My wife and I have quoted Dr. Charles Stanley many, many a time throughout our life, and he always would say in his Charles Stanley voice, if you know him, he would say, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. In his soothing voice, And so this is my application of that and of what I see in the life of Jesus and what I see in these continuing verses. Be obedient and trust God with outcomes. Maybe you've been so consumed with outcomes that you're missing the obedience part. Just be obedient to him and trust him with the consequences, the results, and the outcomes. Let me show it to you in 1 Peter, the next two verses, 22 and 23 of 1 Peter 2. He said, he committed no sin. This is our example that we're to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That judge, sometimes we like to take the judge in the jury seat, don't we? But we're just called to be a witness and to trust the judge who judges justly. He's the judge, he's the jury, but here's what I want you to know about. He is trustworthy and he is worthy. He's on his throne and he loves you so much. And this passage shows us that's why I endure the accusers and the opposition and the persecution. And maybe you can relate with some of that today with some of these action steps or maybe some others today. But I ask you today, who has highest authority in your life? What example are you following? And what would it look like for you this week to just be obedient and trust God with the outcomes in your life, in your situation? I wanna ask you just to bow your heads and ponder that for a few minutes here today. Believers that are in the room, as we look at this series, Messy, what messy situation has God called you to obedience within this week? What messy situation has God said, just trust me with the outcomes and follow me? Just let your trust in me overrule and override and overcome the fear that keeps swallowing you whole. Ask God to show you something this week that he wants you to do, and I believe he's gonna lead you to that. Some of you are here today, and you would say, I just don't know that I am a believer, a part of the family of God, and today I feel the Holy Spirit just prompting on the inside of me. I see myself for who I am. I see that I'm a sinner, and I need a savior, and I see Jesus paid that price for my sin as my perfect sacrifice, and and I wanna trust in him and not in me anymore, And, and I feel the Holy Spirit drawing me and pulling me to that. That's the gospel, is that we are all sinners, and we all fall short of God's glory, but God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus was that perfect sacrifice for us. He died that brutal death and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And he rose from the dead to defeat your sin, to defeat hell, to defeat the grave, to make moments just like now possible so that you could enter into the family of God because you fully surrender your life, trusting in Jesus to save you and nothing and no one else. Maybe you need to take that step wherever you're at right now in the pause of this moment. Will you lay it at the foot of the cross? And I'll pray for you in a moment.